So real quick, just want to shout out everybody that's just here participating with us who hopped on already. It's good to see you all. Good to hear. Well, good to good to see your names. Can't see all your faces, but really good to see your names um, and good to see everybody here hanging out with us. We want to be uh, consistently communicating with you all throughout this entire time. Um, we're just excited as uh, Dallas Black clergy just that you all decided to do this with us today. Um, our real goal, um, our major goal is, as Dallas Black clergy, um, as we always say, is that um, we just want to be clergy, right? We just want to be pastors. Um, we know that social justice is something that we all have a responsibility to. Um, we know the work of justice is something that we all can put our hands to the plow and work towards. But as pastors, as clergy, as people who are called to be shepherds um, and people who are looked to as shepherds, we know that God has given us a particular responsibility uh, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before our God. And so we want to do that in the best ways we can. Um, we're all Black, so we really care about Black people. Um, we care about the gospel. We care about how um, our society and, and how these things are affecting Black people, the people who are in our congregations, the people who are in our neighborhoods, the people who are around our congregations and uh, society as a whole. So today's conversation um, is a continuation of the work we already do. Um, if you want to get a quick crash course in some of the things that we've done, you can go to our website, DallasBlackClergy.com. You can check out um, some of the work that we've been able to do along with other partners in the city, um, just being pastors and just trying to let our light so shine, right? So that uh, people will see our good works and glorify the Father. But without further ado, I want to jump into, the, into today's conversation. Uh, today's conversation is very important to us um, as we've been really looking at what is it going to take to build the sort of economy that's necessary for us to be able to um, not be, not get the short end of the stick, right? Um, but an economy that thinks about our people, that thinks about Black and poor people, that thinks about the people who are at the margins, that thinks about the least of these. And that's what we're going to try to walk towards. That's what we're going to try to build. We don't think we have all the answers, but we think we, we, think we, have, um, we have some ways that we can begin to cultivate those answers together, create collective work and collective plans, and be able to actually change things for our people, for our congregations, and for our society, more importantly. Really want to say at the very beginning, um, as Black pastors, we, we intended this conversation to be geared towards and targeted towards pastors and clergy and faith leaders. That does not mean that if you are not one of those, that you can't be a part, that you can't listen in, that you can't take part. Um, but that's going to be our focus and that's going to be our angle today. Um, so ride with us. I think we're going to have a great conversation. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce to you all uh, the Reverend Dr. Michael Waters, uh, pastor of Abundant Life AME Church. Um, and he's just going to give us some level setting and, and help us uh, begin to walk down this road. Pastor Mike, it's on to you. Good morning, everyone. It was previously held that the first coronavirus-related death in the U.S. occurred on February the 28th of this year. However, newly released autopsies now inform that it may have occurred on February the 6th, when a 57-year-old Northern California woman succumbed to the disease. Still, using February 28th as a touchpoint, by March 26th, America passed the 1,000-death threshold. And as of today, April the 23rd, less than a month later, and as of distancing mandates, the death toll has now surpassed 48,000. And even this may not reflect the full measure of the fatalities thus far. Indeed, it is our prayer that God would bless the dead and comfort those that mourn. In the midst of this carnage, Many have voiced their desire for things to return to normal. They have called for a return to normalcy. The reality is that th things will never be normal again, nor should we desire for them to be. For our communities, normal meant the continuation of the functional white supremacy in every facet of American society. Normal for us meant mass incarceration, 
gentrification and redlining, the continuing loss of millions of acres of black farmland. It meant the miseducation of our children, increased wealth disparities. It meant that black women were both the most educated people group in America and the lowest paid. We should not desire things ever to be normal again. But we must also acknowledge that there are no quick fixes. Yes, we must attend to the pressing present needs of our community. However, we must also recognize that many of the jobs that our people worked will not return. For as Dr. King spoke in his 1964 book, Why We Can't Wait, automation is replacing a certain demographic of workers and will dramatically increase poverty roles. We are living that reality right now. And this will have an ongoing consequence for our people, for our communities, and for our churches. Now, Governor Como of New York last week spoke of the need to reimagine society, to reimagine the possibilities of what could be, and work together to ensure that what could be and what should be is what is. That is why this is a gift for us that we now move through the Christian season of Easter time. We are living between the power of the resurrection and the promise of dunamis power on Pentecost. For when Pentecost comes, God's power is poured out on both sons and daughters. Those sons and daughters move in that power, not just to sing, not just to shout, not just to bear witness, but to abolish poverty and to strengthen their communities. The reality is, is that we have long lived as a people in a pandemic moment. May we now embrace the power of the resurrection and the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit to prepare a better way. God bless. How you doing, everyone? Great, great. Had to, had to, had to find you for a second. I was trying to uh, make sure I live stream. But hey, um, thank you so much for that, um, Reverend Dr. Walters just letting us know the journey that we're about to take. Um, right now, I want to introduce um, our subject matter expert and um, one of the gifts that God has given to us, um, both in this city and in this country, and that is the Reverend Dr. Michael Green, who is also a professor of economics at uh, Paul Quinn College. Um, he has, um, um, God has just given us this great gift of wisdom and knowledge um, that lives right here in our city, uh, in the city of Dallas, um, and doesn't take it for granted. Not only uh, is he uh, a pastor, he was a pastor of a congregation here, um, but he understands his role uh, to teach um, and to mentor us in the ways of understanding economics. And so he's written a book uh, called A Way Out of No Way, uh, prerequisites of the beloved community. Um, and so we want to start by um, asking you, Doc Green, you know, as, as Reverend Dr. Waters just laid out, right, um, we, we are dealing with something that's going to be a long journey, right? We're not going to get here anytime soon. We know that this is something that uh, King talked about. We know this is something that um, uh, presidents have talked about and others have talked about. Uh, throughout history um, and even in our current moment right uh, while we have a um, uh, an administration that is you know offering a stimulus you know a twelve hundred dollars here or you know a little bit there and then trying to force us all back into the workforce immediately talk to us about um, just this problem right and why just simply stimulating an old economy is not what we need um, and, and why that's actually not good uh, for people who look like us and the people we serve. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate. So with regard to stimulus, let's talk a little bit initially about what that means when we, we hear that word. So generally, when we talk about stimulating the economy, 
you're talking about uh, getting people spending money, getting them back in uh, the restaurants, getting them back in the movie theaters, uh, getting them back in the workplace and to uh, spend money and juice the economy up, right? So that the economy is running, that jobs are being created and thus forth. I would contend that what we are experiencing right now, this COVID-19 induced recession, differs in some very significant ways from the Great Recession of a little more than uh, 10 years ago and the um, um, tech uh, bust uh, in early uh, 2000. So with those recessions, and particularly with the Great Recession in mind, the goal was to, and I think rightfully so, to stimulate the economy. Uh, when you and I as consumers aren't spending money, um, that has a depressing effect upon the economy. But we're looking at something different. And the 2008 uh, uh, Great Recession should not be the template for dealing with this COVID-19 induced recession. We're looking at now not just an economic problem, but we're looking also at a public health problem. And so we have this combination of uh, economic uh, distress as well as uh, a public health, uh, this, this public health issue. And so rather than start talking about stimulating the economy, I would argue that the first thing that we need to do in crafting any type of uh, response uh, to the current situation is that we have to protect the health and safety of our folks and that everything ought to flow from there. It ought not to flow uh, uh, initially from, well, let's get people back into the tattoo parlors or the barbershops or the hairdressers and um, in the restaurants, right? We need to start with the, uh, with the uh, basic proposition that we are called to uh, protect and defend uh, the health and the welfare of our people. So what that means to me is that rather than trying to encourage people or compelling people to re-enter the labor market, that at least initially, our task is not to get people to re-enter the labor market, but to keep people out of the labor market. Oh, wow. And, so and, to, provide, and to provide protection for those who are already in and have no other choice to see themselves as having no other choice but to continue to participate. The problem in getting this type of thing uh, across is that um, our representatives, as well as many of, uh, many of us, we, we worship gross domestic product, right? So the big thing is that you always have to have the economy now who are um, telling people, hey, Let's reopen the economy, get you back in there. Um, our people who are acutely concerned with gross domestic product. Now, understand, I'm not arguing that gross domestic product, GDP, I'm not arguing that it is unimportant. I am arguing rather that um, it is an insufficient metric for measuring our economic and our social progress. And so the first thing that I will argue is that Rather than forcing people to uh, go into the uh, labor market, we need to be continue to practicing our social uh, distancing, but we have to make it possible. So Doc, so Doc Green, um, yeah, to jump in there. So like you were about to pivot to a question that I was about to ask, and I think that may be on everyone's mind, right? It's like. I, you know, understand, like my own brother, right? He's been furloughed. Uh, he works in a factory out in Ennis making those sterilite plastic tubs. And they furloughed them for a few weeks, um, which was great with pay. Um, but he just got found out that he has to go back to work tomorrow, right? And so there's this kind of, like, you're, you know, this idea of, like, we need to keep people out of the labor market, right? Um, and, and we do worship the gross domestic product and people need to make money to take care of themselves. 
So mm-hmm. how then do we, from a, a, as clergy, as faith leaders, how are we, how, how, how do we enter into this, right? Dealing with the reality that both we're going to, people are going to go back to work and simultaneously we're trying to fight for an economy where people don't have to go back to work in this moment. How do we, how do we wrestle with that a little bit um, from the dual roles of you being both a pastor and an economist? Yeah, so the first thing is that, and this is really hard for, I think, a lot of people to accept, is that the first thing is that we have to recognize that for the next quarter, maybe perhaps the next two quarters, that there's going to be a drop in GDP, right? And a lot of that is going to come as a result of us trying to flatten the epidemiological uh, 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 curve. And I think that's not a long range strategy that's sustainable. But in the short term, I think what it means that we as pastors and, you know, in in fact, all people of goodwill is that we have to advocate that the basic needs of people are met during this 60, 90, 100, uh, uh, 20 days or whatever, however long, you know, um, it might be. Folks still need to pay their rent. Uh, folks still need uh, folks still need to eat. Folks still need to have uh, the lights on. Um, and folks still need running water. And so we have to advocate and um, to uh, and, and fight for uh, uh, that that folks' basic needs are met. And when I as as I look at it right now, the scientific consensus seems to be that we are. Um, encouraging people to prematurely enter the labor market. Now, let me just make this one other point. So who do you think is going into the labor market in this first round? Who do you think are going to be the first round casualties? And there will be some casualties. Tell us who it's they going are, Doc. To, yeah, it's, it's, going to, it's, it's, it's going to be people, uh, black and brown bodies and women, who work in restaurants, who uh, 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 work, in the, work in the grocery stores, uh, who work in the service sector, that sector in which they're disproportionately represented, that they're going to be the first line casualties of uh, a premature rush into the, uh, into the labor market. And so, again, we have to uh, think anew and re- reimagine in the short term um, how can we protect um, uh, our folk and also how can we uh, increase the level of, of protection and safety for those who are already in. Now, because this, you know, if, if you're in the top 10% or the top 1% of the income distribution, right, this premature reopening of the economy has no impact, direct impact on you. You're going to do what you've always been able to do. Yeah. Telecommute, uh, Zoom, all that stuff. But it's at the lower end of the economic rungs who are going to um, uh, feel this uh, economic pressure to re-enter the labor market, and they will be a spike in um, in uh, COVID nineteen cases. So, so Doc, um, thank you for that. I, I want to sort of pivot to. Like, you know, like you, you've sort of laid out the realities, right, of the problems that we're sitting in. You know what I mean? Um, you know, we, we have an economy that was created that worships GDP. Um, we have an economy that was created to not allow um, black people to access the things that we need to survive. We have an economy that was created to not allow women to access the things that they need to survive. And so then we put black women, right, who, like my sister, who is a a home health nurse, right, who is now being pulled a million different directions and trying to do this work, and so many other black women. So we have this economy that was set up in this way. We're into this pandemic. We're we're like, all right, we got to figure out a couple things here. People are going to be going back to work, and people need to get their needs met. So one of the things that I heard you say is, one, we need to advocate um, on higher levels, whether it's in our city, our county, or at the state level, right, for our people to be able to get the basic need, their basic needs met without actually having to go into the labor force, right? And so I think that's one thing. The other thing is, 
um, um, while we're doing that, we're going to have to advocate for a market, right, that doesn't make um, um, uh, our poorest and our most vulnerable people um, essential workers at a moment when our country is in its, its worst situation. So mm -hmm. having said that, let's talk about visioning forward, right? Like, what does this beloved economy look like? Like, if we could wave a magic wand, if we could do our work and work together along this long journey, um, um, what, what, what does it look like? And, and not only what does it look like, but maybe what are some things we can begin to do along the way, right, as we're trying to walk along and shepherd our people through this, through this um, very, very tough time? Well, let me talk a little bit about what it looks like. And I think Dr. Waters uh, pointed this out um, uh, earlier. You know, one of the things that this crisis has revealed, and many of us knew this already, is the presence of significant fissures along race, along class, along gender in this current economy. And that uh, uh, lack of health care and things of that nature made folk even more vulnerable to this current situation, right? When you lack health care, you lack affordable housing, you lack a decent wage, you lack uh, a, 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 a sick leave, you lack uh, a jobs that uh, uh, that pay that pay a decent wage. And what you do, what you're doing, when, when you're not providing people with that, then you are in essence sort of removing any buffers. Right, that could absorb economic shocks. Right. Can you say that and one the, more time for us, Doc? So when when you have an, an economy such as we have right now, where significant numbers of people don't have access to medical care, where significant number of people are homeless, where significant number of people are incarcerated, and so forth, those the presence of those things function as buffers. Mm against economic shocks mm. so the, it, 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 so uh, accordingly the absence of those things right means the lack of buffers in, increases the intensity of suffering and so we have an economy that uh, doesn't buffer so to speak um large numbers you know large numbers of people um in this in in this country and so going forward is that we need to think about uh, reimagining an economy that properly buffers people and that understands that uh, uh, people have or ought to have uh, certain economic and social rights, right? And these rights are not, should not be dependent upon charity or should not be dependent upon a largesse of some individual, which is, you know, great when they do that. But these rights need to be respected and accorded to um, all human beings simply because they're human beings and from a theological perspective um, that we all are created in the image of God and therefore our social and, and our economic interest that it reflects uh, the protection and the promotion of human dignity. Mm. So, so this is really, this is really dope. Um, um, uh, Reverend Miranda Furman dropped in. She she uh, she said, "Right, Dr. Michael Green. If these first return, uh, if the people who are first returning to work fatally succumb to COVID-19, she says it actually lowers the unemployment rate and lowers uh, the pe people looking for work slash hiring pool and helps this economic system that we've had and makes the data points." Um, these leaders need to look like they're doing a good job on the economy, right? That typical <laughs> voters care about. And if I if I can uh, if I can um, synopsize that, what I think what I think I'm reading is um, Dr. Furman is saying, look, we want to send our poorest, our most vulnerable people back into the workplace. If they succumb to the virus, then well, we've taken care of them, right? It's almost like if the poor die, they die. If our incarcerated brothers die, they die. If our black women die, they die. Um, and, and so it would seem then, as you were saying, that now the church, right, 
Um, we as faith leaders, nonprofit organizations, we have now become the very buffer, <laughs> right, that you're talking about, right? And so we're in this weird place where we're both the buffer, but we're not, we don't need to be the buffer, right? That's not what the system is set up to be. Yet we are here, right? So how then do you see us both playing the role of both being the buffer, trying to hold back as much of this as possible, or, or, or I would say, you know, to use the Noah's Ark metaphor, get as many people into the ark as possible, right? Um, while we're also uh, fighting upstream and, and making sure that our government, our local government and our federal government are doing the things they're supposed to do so we do not have to then show up in a way that we weren't set up to show up. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 in, in, in some ways, I think you um, answered the question of giving the answer that 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 what I would have uh, given, and hopefully, we can um, flesh this out uh, more in terms of of the dialogue. But here's the first thing I think is that the church community cannot be expected to bear this burden alone, right? Mm -hmm. Most states are constitutionally required to balance their budget. Right? And so we need more aid to the states from the, uh, from the federal level. Um, uh, we need uh, uh, at the, at the, at the uh, local level, there's some, things that can, there's some things that can be done that we should be advocating, for instance, uh, with, with incarceration. Right? You can't practice social distancing and the penal institutions. And so at the very least, we should be talking about an immediate release of, I don't know, let's say uh, individuals who are 55 uh, of age and over and who um, have uh, comorbidities, right? Um, that um, will um, you know, make uh, their, their journey much more difficult if they contract COVID-19. So there's, there's, there's a range of things that I think that we as pastors and, and, and uh, as churches can be advocating and can be uh, uh, fighting for, but at the same time understanding that this is gonna take a level of resources and a level of political commitment, right? That um, is going to require uh, more than churches to, um, uh, to, de to deal with, right? So it's not to say we don't do anything, we do everything that we possibly can. But at the same time, we recognize that, you know, there's some um, larger, broader things happening in the overall economy that's going to require concerted actions, concerted um, action at both uh, at the uh, federal level, national level, local level, and, um, and the state level. And let me just say this real quick uh, to what you were saying uh, a moment ago um, uh, uh, in terms of, and also with the issue that Dr. Miranda raised uh, about first line casualties. So we're sitting here and we're witnessing what I would call the politics of disposability. Mm. Right? There are some folk who are, you know, disposable, right? Um, and they're gonna be the first ones to go into the barber shops. The first one um, to get the nails done. Uh, the first ones that go back to work at Amazon. Not, and often not because they want to, be, but because they're impelled by economic necessity. And if they were to say, no, I don't feel comfortable doing this, right? Or they tell their employer, I, I'm not doing this anymore. And um, they are let go. That person would not be eligible for unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't get unemployment benefits if you quit. Right. right? And so you see, you, you see how the, 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 um, you get a sense of the dilemma and the problems that uh, we're confronted with, the, the multifaceted, and we have to talk about uh, different ways in which to uh, approach uh, those things. Well, Doc Green, so thank you so much uh, for just sharing with us over these, these last few minutes and helping us sort of level set um, from an economic perspective as well as a pastoral perspective of you know, like, this is what we're dealing with, y'all. Like, this is not small. 
And I think we all know that. It's one of the reasons why you all are on this call. It's one of the reasons why you all tuned in. Those of, us, those of you who are uh, watching the stream on Facebook, um, it's one of the reasons why you're here because we understand this is huge. Um, and part of the, you know, um, as I go through therapy and all sorts of things, right? Um, one of the things that, you know, my therapist always says, the first thing to do is this, like, get a handle on what we're actually dealing with. Mm -hmm. What's mm -hmm. the problem, right? How, and, 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 and so we can all know it. And then we're going to have to start walking the steps slowly to be able um, uh, to, to get to the next uh, place. I want to read some of the uh, comments that came through in the chat. Um, Norman Tidmore, what's up, Norman, man? Um, you know, he, he's going back to my Noah reference, and he says, it took labor and obedience for Noah to build the ark, not government. That's big right um and, and and that is not to say that government doesn't have a role in taking care of the people but i believe what norman is say, simply saying here is the people of god are going to have to put our hands to the plow roll up our sleeves and and be committed and obedient in order to actually protect and save our people during this time so thank you for that norman another comment i see from uh i'm going to get your I, I hope i don't mess up your name but this says uh glenkey redrick um, um, it says there should be a partnership, but as faith leaders, we have a responsibility on all levels. And Dr. King's message, where do we go from here? He clearly states, we should make sure we are doing all that we can to provide a robust community with jobs, housing, healthcare, mm -hmm. et cetera. Thank you so much for that, Thank because you. it's the truth. I wanna, I wanna um, put a fine point on one of the last things that Doc Green left with us. So we're, we're, we're dealing with the politics of disposability. And that's big. I, I want you all to hold that in your hearts. That means the people who we have in office, the people who we have representing us, see our people, the people we love, the people we minister to, the people who are in our families, our mothers, fathers, cousins, sisters, brothers, they see us as disposable. And that can't be the case. Um, to that end, um, pastors have um, a very specific responsibility and a very specific um, um, uh, role, I believe, in being able to um, share this message and being able to organize people. So give me a minute. I'm going to switch. And I'm going to share my screen one more time. Y'all just bear with me really quickly. I want to get back to our slideshow. Give me a second here. And I lost it right away, but I'm gonna find it, don't you worry. Because as I'm doing this, what we wanna do is, what we understand that um, is that pastors, I always say this, right? Um, I, had the, I had the great, um, uh, um, I would say, uh, privilege to um, pastor. Um, as a staff pastor, but I've never been able to pastor, you know, as a, as a full-time pastor. But the one thing I know, and I've been in the church my whole life, is that pastors have uh, one thing that we can control every week. We may not be able to control the trustees. We may not be able to control the deacons. We may not be able to control how much money comes in or goes out, um, the people. But the one thing that a pastor can do every week is preach. And that's not a small thing. Um, I think about uh, the prophet Ezekiel when he was in the valley of the dry bones. And God comes and asks the prophet one simple question. Can these dry bones live? And the prophet says to God, look, I don't know. You know, you're God. Uh, and so God then tells the prophet to do one thing, prophesy. The prophet begins to prophesy. All of a sudden, the bones come together and breath comes into the body and all these things. What, the, what God did not tell the prophet to do was go down there and grab the bones and put bone to bone. And he didn't tell the prophet to go and connect all the pieces. God told the prophet to do one thing, and that is prophesy. And as the prophet prophesied, God connected the bones, put life into the people, and raised up a great army. And so the clergy and pastors who are listening, who are watching, who are on this, we want to show you all really quickly how you can proclaim this message, how you can prophesy building the beloved community to your people. So we have uh, some of our black clergy 
they're going to give us really quick, like two minute tight sermonettes. And if you've ever been to seminary, you know, they're seminary trained. We're going to have this two minute tight sermonettes. But a couple of our clergy are just going to share with us how to actually preach and teach on the building the beloved community. So our first uh, preacher will be none other than the Reverend Dr. Pastor Irie Session, co-pastor of the gathering. She'll be preaching on building the beloved community from Luke 18, one through eight. Um, and I'm gonna read that for you all right now. The parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, whew, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. <laughs> and the <laughs> Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on the earth. Reverend Dr. Irie Session. Unmute yourself, Dr. Irie. Oh. There you go. You're good to go now. Okay. During his presidency, Barack Obama made the following claim. You can judge a nation and how successful it will be based on how it treats its women and its girls. In our preaching text, we see the mistreatment of a woman. She repeatedly brings her case to a judge, a, a person in a high profile position, one that gave him authority over groups of people, a, a judge, a supposed arbiter of justice. The woman brought her case to a particular kind of judge, one who the text says neither feared God nor had respect for people. This woman brought her case to a judge who lacked empathy. Perhaps he lacked empathy because uh, like the one running our country today, never had to live on the wrong side of the tracks. Maybe this judge had never not known where his next meal would come from. Maybe he did not live paycheck to paycheck, so he couldn't empathize with where this woman found herself. Most probably economically disadvantaged and exploited. Now I say economically disadvantaged because she was advocating for herself. Her father wasn't pleading her case, neither was her husband. See, a woman in the first century without a male in her life to provide economic sustainability was a woman most vulnerable. But listen, we don't need to go to the first century to find women who lack financial stability. No, no. Each and every day in the 21st century, there are women who Dr. James Cone called the underside of the underside. Dr. Carrie Day, woman is theologian and ethicist in her book, Unfinished Business, Black Women, the Black Church and the Struggle to Thrive in America, describes an underclass of the underclass, that is poor black women. Dr. Day argues the economic suffering of black women must be acknowledged and embraced if black churches and other black religious institutions are to create spaces in which black women, regardless of their economic status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Dr. Session. Now, we want to, as you, Dr. Session does a great job of showing us how to preach the text from a womanist perspective, how to, how to center uh, women, particularly black women, in the text and see them for who they are. And this was an amazing, amazing way of doing that and giving you all a, a, a way of seeing how to do that really well. Thank you so much, Dr. Session. Next, we wanna, we're going to have Pastor Kwesi Kamau from Impact Church. He's going to preach on building the beloved economy using Matthew 6, 22 through 23. And their text reads, 
The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Reverend Dr. Kwesi Kamau of Impact Church. Let us pray, speak, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. These words arise from Matthew chapter 6, 22 and 23 in the Sermon on the Mount. Economy is based on beliefs and values. This little paper dollar is worth nothing in and of itself. It is a piece of paper. You were hungry, you couldn't eat it. If you were cold, you couldn't wear it. But if you were to rip it up, you would care because of the belief that you have invested in it. You trust a system that tells you that this dollar is valuable. But the same system that tells you the dollar is valuable also tells you that black and brown bodies are not. Mm. That immigrant bodies who are non-European are not. That poor white bodies are not. That female bodies of any nationality or color, unless they are commodified for perverse consumption are not. Same system that valuates our money evaluates our lives on a trumped up racial sliding scale that dumps on women and girls at every knob. I just left Nigeria. In her clairvoyant historical drama about the Nigerian Civil War, the Biafran War of 1967 through 1970, novelist Chimamanda Adichie hits the right note. When the protagonist is asked about whether his country sided economically with leftist or rightist positions, he waves his hand and said, Africa is not concerned with those disputes. I bring this up because I want to say that God is not concerned with those disputes either. God is not as much concerned with who is on the left as God is concerned with who is left behind. God is not concerned with who is on the right as God is concerned with who is in the right. Jesus said when talking about economics in the Sermon on the Mount, the eye is the lamp of the body. We've been living in great darkness in our time, in our culture, in our place, because our eyes have not been healthy enough to see the values and beliefs that we allow to abide and drive our economy. We need to see the unhealthy, unrighteous spirituality behind the economic decisions our cities, Las Vegas, our states, Texas, and nation are making every day. So you may ask the question, why would we as pastors have an economic prerogative? We are not economists. What does pastoring during a pandemic have to do with economics? I give you this answer. Faith is our business. Belief is our business. And we must do God's work of calling this system of belief that evaluates our money and our lives to God's order. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Kamal. Whew. Faith is our business. Faith is our business. Thank you so much for that, sir. Now we're going to hear... Second. Now we're going to hear from Pastor Fia Kennedy of Wesley Chapel AME Church on building the beloved economy. She's going to be talking to us from Genesis 47, 18 through 20. And it reads, when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, we cannot hide from my Lord that our money is all spent and the herds of cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Shall we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land in exchange for food. We with our land will become slaves to Pharaoh. Just give us seed so that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, 
all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe upon them and the land became Pharaoh's. Pastor Reverend Fia Kennedy. Holy Spirit, meet us with power. Allow your people to hear what they need to hear for the glory of you in the name of Jesus. Feast or famine, feast or famine. In this passage of scripture, we have people enduring a famine. There are five years remaining. We know Joseph, he had the dream that there will be seven years of famine and seven years of plentiness. And we have this passage of scripture that's reminding us in this day and time that we understand that in this context, they sold their livestock for grain out of desperation. They were permitted to work the land and keep a portion of the profit, but in the end, they did not have ownership. This is detrimental to long-term viability. Today, we have the U.S. Labor Department who has reported over 26.5 million Americans who have filed unemployment. Is it 20, one more again, 26.5 million Americans who have filed unemployment, feast or famine. I submit to you today that the beloved economy is one when all have what we need void of oppression. We all know uh, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, it says that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will give, forgive their sin and will heal their land. So while we're waiting on the rain to come and while we're waiting on our Lord God to heal our land, I need to just pick them up something that is really important here. When we look at the scripture and we look where we are today, I need you to think on long terms. Think long term. Don't allow desperation to be your demise. Hold, do what you need to do to hold on to your property. It is our real estate will always have value. It is our real estate is our, one of our greatest assets. Think long term, not just for right now. Don't think for tomorrow. Don't think for this next week. I need you to think about it for another generation behind you. Come on here, gentrification. Come on here, buying up land. But hold on to your land. And can I tell you, when you think long term, you'll have a boldness, a holy boldness to renegotiate the terms. Can I tell you, when they were in desperation, they went to Joseph and said, listen, listen, all we have is our bodies and our, and our land. And, and all we have is just our bodies and our land. And Joseph said, well, give me, your, you'll be in servitude to Pharaoh. We'll take your land for some grain. Don't be sell out. Don't sell out in the famine when you know your intellectual property will give you a feast. We negotiate the terms and say, well, listen, I understand we get a portion of the profit, but you still have my land. Let's renegotiate this. I keep my land. You still get a portion of my profits, but I keep my land. We go back and renegotiate the terms. Can I tell you one more thing? While we wait on God to bring us through, while we wait on the rain, while we wait on our Lord to heal the land, can I tell you, don't give away your power. You may be desperate because you don't know how this is going to transpire. You don't know when your next meal is going to come by. But do not give away your power. Your creativity is residual income. You still have leverage. Use what you have and use what you have wisely. Your intellectual property is residual income. Income. God has you the ability to get wealth. And many times we depend on other entities what God has already put within us. I'm telling you, don't get, think long term. Don't give away your power. Use what you have. It's something about understanding. Get this. Here's the good news. The priests of everybody in the land, the priests held on to their land. They didn't sell their land because the priests. Uh, yeah, yeah, the nonprofit organizations, they receive rations from the government. The beloved community will break the bread, yeah, bless the bread, yeah, allow the Lord to supernaturally strip 
touch the bread. And we, as service of the Lord God on high, will help feed our community. Ah, that's good news. But can I tell you, the same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead is interceding for you and for me. And he says, you have power that's in you. Use what you have. The good news is the same God who raised Jesus from the dead is working in the background, working everything out for the good of them who love and call according to his purpose. So if God is working out in the background, what we do in the foreground is think long-term, hold on, do what we need to do to hold on to our assets. Your body is viable income. Your intellectual property, your creativity, the resources in your mind will see you through while we wait on the Lord to send the rain. May God bless you. Thank you so much, Reverend Kennedy. Thank you so much for that word. Our, our, our creativity is our residual income. Don't you give up your stuff just because we in this moment. And last but not least, we have uh, Pastor Jamie Callisar, Reverend Dr. Jamie Callisar of City Temple, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he's gonna be talking, building the beloved economy using Mark 2, 23 through 24 and 27. And it reads, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. Reverend Dr. Jamie Callisar. Thank you. Lord, please be with me. Mark introduces us to Jesus' social campaign. It is a campaign in action and an assault on the Jewish social order in Capernaum as well as the Roman Empire. After he is baptized, Jesus begins to work. Mark shows Jesus in action. He is not dormant or dead. He is an activist on behalf of the marginalized. Where there is a crisis, it is time for the church and for us as believers in God to be activated and to agitate. As we can see Jesus' life, as we look at, as we trail it from John, Mark 1, he cast out the demon. The next scene, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. In the evening, they say many bring that are sick and Jesus heals them. As he continues, he preaches in Galilee and goes out into town. He heals a man in leprosy and tells them to go to the synagogue. And then in chapter two, he heals a paralyzed man and he forgives him. And then Jesus empowers him to keep up his bed and walk. But now we see as Jesus changing the game, the Pharisaic rule and the rules of the Pharisees made it legal to ostracize and marginalize the poor because they were sick. Because if they were sick, they could not work. And since they could not work, they did not have money. And if you had no money, they could not purchase sacrifices to have their sins forgiven. And to be cut off from the temple is to essentially say, you are not a citizen, and you are not a human being. You are a prisoner of our society. But by Jesus healing and delivering them, he is doing a direct assault on their caste system. And now these sick people have been reinstated. And so as we look at today's text, Jesus is still moving we discover that the Pharisees aren't on the same team. They are still playing their own game. Mark now tells us that Jesus and his boys are walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath day. As they are walking through the grain fields, they are breaking off heads of grain to eat. Then the Pharisees say, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? But Jesus is showing us and revealing us to something more about the game. The Pharisees are not simply mad that Jesus is doing this on the Sabbath, but their indignation with Jesus is the fact that they are eating grain. One passage says they are trampling on it. Jesus and the disciples are destroying and eating the grain. They are destroying and eating the product. They are destroying and eating their profits. He is messing with their money. He is messing with their investments. He is touching their supply. History informs us that Pharisees advocated local distribution to ensure that provincial priests received their due grain. So there were a lot of politics and money involved in the grain. There was lobbying in the political arena for those that were done with the grain. But let me tell you something. Once we start messing with the money, folks going to come after us. And so as Jesus responds, and pardon me as I paraphrase this, he says, I'm the HNIC, the head Nazarene in charge. I can do whatever I want. The disciples were picking and eating grain because it was accessible to them and it was available. Pharisees were hoarding the resources for profit while people are going hungry. And we know that we can't have beloved community without beloved economy. 
How dare you disrespect your citizens by giving them a check that's less than minimum wage to live off? How dare you disrespect my essential workers by having them work from day to day, risking their lives without doubling their pay? How dare you redline and cut my children off from amassing wealth by deciding who should get loans to buy homes and who should not? How dare you deplete South Dallas of supermarkets that give us fresh produce? Our state has the largest grocery gap in the nation, which means it has the lowest number of marked supermarkets per capita than any other state. Jesus is saying, you have resources, it's available, let my people have it. It's like the song says, ain't no fun if my homies can't have none. And right now, as we see in this political climate, that there are resources being held back because we are being used for profit and political gain. And then as I begin to close, Jesus informs them about the Sabbath. He says, look, I know that this is the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not the people meet the requirements of the Sabbath. The true meaning of the Sabbath is redemptive power. Sabbath is justice for all. Sabbath is forgiveness of debt. Sabbath is releasing the prisoner. Sabbath is giving what to others, what we do, what we have so that they may participate in the Jubilee. And last but not least, we understand that we are called to do the redemptive work that God has called us to do to build the beloved economy and to give access to those that have been cut off from what belongs to them in the first place. Well, Reverend, uh, y'all just preached uh, all kinds of sermons. If you don't know what to preach or you trying to figure out how to preach it, you were just given a master class in how to preach the beloved economy to your people. Understanding that preaching is not something that is just gonna, that's gonna change uh, um, everything. We still gotta go out and do some other things, but we have a responsibility to minister and speak to our people in ways that allow them to be encouraged and move forward and fight this fight with us. So we're gonna close. If you all just give me five more minutes, we're gonna close out. And I want to just, here's a quick slide with some of the resources that were given today by way of books. We have A Way Out of No Way, The Economic Prerequisites of the Beloved Community. You can find that on Amazon.com. And that's written by none other than our own Reverend Dr. Michael Green. And then another a book that was referenced, Unfinished Business, Black Women, the Black Church, and the Struggle to Thrive in America, uh, written by um, another one of our own uh, Metroplex, uh, um, Dr. Carrie Day. You can also find that on Amazon. These books will help you sort of craft and understand what we're walking towards. Now let's talk about, let's talk about next steps. What can we do? We know that I saw a question that popped up that said, hey, we need to figure out how we help our people access the grants and the programs that are already available. And you're absolutely correct. That is work that we need to do and we will continue to do. As a matter of fact, Dallas Black Clergy is going to work hard to have a resource page on our website that allows people to connect with ways that they can resource and access some of the grants and things that are already available that have been made available by the government. But we, as we've said, there's going to be, there's a responsibility or something that we have to do. And with some of the things that we are going to do as Dallas Black Clergy, we're going to start a, a collective impact benevolence fund. Right. This is something that's separate from our individual congregations efforts, but we're going to choose a need or two to focus on food, shelter, health care. And, and what we started doing is and we're going to collect money and be able to resource people in our community to be able to meet some of these immediate needs that our people have. We know we don't have millions of dollars. We don't have billions of dollars. But whatsoever we have, we're going to try to use it to fill the gap while we're fighting upstream and trying to change the economy. And then lastly, we want you to preach and teach on building the beloved economy. Like the, the words that you heard today should have motivated you, inspired you, but your people need to hear the same message. Your people need to hear these messages and they need to hear it coming from you. So as we walk towards the Christian uh, celebration of Pentecost, which is the time between Easter, uh, um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and uh, the Holy Spirit showing up with us in Acts 2, we want you to take it to bookend it. Um, the weekend of May 1st through the 3rd, preach a sermon on your stream about building the beloved economy. The weekend of May 29th to the 31st, which would be uh, Pentecost Sunday, preach and teach a sermon about building the beloved economy. Bring your people along. 
And in the meantime, Dallas Black Clergy, we're going to be working and organizing with our build the city efforts along with other things to try to put together a strategy so that we can all be working together to begin to speak truth to power, speak to our public officials, change policies, change laws so that we no longer have a politics of, of just letting our people die, a politics of forgetting about who our people, but a politics that moves things forward. So these are some things that we can do together to begin to move this forward. And so without further ado, um, to, to close us out today, um, we, have, we have our very own Reverend Dr. Marcus King, who is going to just close us out, um, make sure I didn't miss anything, make sure he fills in any gaps, um, and, then, and then we'll be about our way. Staying connected with us on DallasBlackClergy.com. I'm also going to launch, have launched a poll that I would love for you all to take. They're just yes or no questions. So it can give us some information and some feedback. Wanting to know if this was good for you. Wanting to know if it's something that we can continue. Um, but outside of that, we love you. And I will turn it over to Reverend Dr. Marcus King, who will uh, close us out and make sure we didn't miss anything. Reverend King, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't think, Evan, we've missed anything today. I think uh, Dr. Green set the whole stage, uh, as well as Dr. Waters beginning, letting us know that this is not uh, something short term. This is a long range journey that we're on. And so we need to make sure that we don't uh, get tired in the short, short term because we are like Elijah. We have a long journey ahead of us. And we have to make sure that we have to eat right now. Many people have to eat bread and water for, for this moment. But the journey is ahead of us, and God will give us that. I thank Dr. Green for uh, laying out uh, some of the, the ailments that are taking place and sharing uh, his economic strategy for that, laying that plan out. Please go back and get those, uh, those, those layouts and also purchase his book, uh, to encourage you with that. And then we can't say enough about the, the way that the message has been laid out uh, through these dynamic preachers, not just sermons, but also strategies, also ways to look at our current situations, uh, the individuals in our community, in our churches. I think that is relevant and making the word relevant to where we are. And let's not make, miss that opportunity. And then finally, uh, the practical pieces of laying it together, there were some things like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's Bill of Rights uh, that we have uh, talked and discussed personally uh, that can be applied in many ways. Uh, that is a good way to strategize, take it back to your communities and make sure uh, your churches as well to make sure that this is implemented. And so as we get ready to close out in prayer, uh, we look forward for you joining the journey. And the truth of the matter is everybody's not ready for the journey. Uh, but listen, you need to be ready for the journey. Bring some people along who want to make a long lasting change in the community. Let's go to God in prayer and let's thank him for what he has done. God, thank you for this day. We thank you for being a wonderful, powerful, patient God. We know God that uh, this is not something that is going to take place overnight of curing something that has been in the earth for a long time but we thank you for your grace. We thank you for strategists and strategies to help us walk through uh, this valley of shadow of death. God, we thank you for uh, all of those who have participated on this call, who have listened in to find strategies, to find hope, uh, not just long-term, but even right now. We pray for them. We pray for their situations, God. We have no idea what they have to deal with, but we're grateful that you brought us together. And it's something that was said today will give them hope. Something that was said today will give their community and their church members hope that they are not by themselves. And God, as we leave this call today, we ask God that we apply what we've heard so that we can make this world, make this community, and make our people better for the glory of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you all. We love you all. We look forward to hear from you again. Be looking at your email. Look, at, uh, we look, look to your emails to get some messaging from us about how we're going to continue to move forward and how we're going to keep this thing going. Um, and be checking our website, DallasBlackClergy.com. Um, we're going to be doing our best to try to get information up and try to just figure out how we stay connected, 
how we build, how we help our people as we climb. Um, thank you all, Dallas Black Clergy. Thank you all for hanging out with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe, move around, drink water, get rest. Love you all. Talk to you later.